As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, today is the last uh, message in our theme, Home Sweet Home, looking at the lessons we can learn from being within our homes. And today we're gonna to talk about gardens. So before we get there, let's take a moment to kind of review where we've come. So the very first message that we shared, I was down in the basement talking about foundations, those solid principles that make up the base of our life so that when the storms come, our lives aren't shaken, but we can ground ourselves in them. If you remember, I used the rock, which stood for resilience, optimism, commitment, and kindness. The next week, I spoke about doors, the transitions in life, the way we move from one thing to another, the fluid part of life, and the lessons we learn there. The week after that, I was in the kitchen, and then out in the snow, and we talked about the things that create healthy lives, and I spoke about the fruits of the spirit. Last week, our topic was closets, discovering our authentic self, which too often we hide away. And so we come to our last one today, which is gardens. The philosopher Cicero once said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. Now, let me begin by saying this. Me giving a talk about gardens is like Donald Trump giving a talk about humility or Genghis Khan giving a talk about loving your neighbors. What I know about gardens is almost nothing. I've never planted a garden. I've never cared for a garden. I've never purchased things for a garden. And the idea of spending two hours on a Saturday wandering around a garden center is right up there with dental surgery. I'm not a gardener, but it's not to say that I haven't wanted to be. I've kind of always wanted to have my own garden. I think gardening must have its own very special rewards. And I'm so impressed with people who do it, particularly those who can't wait for the snow to melt in March so that they can get out there and start getting that garden ready. And I know a lot of ministers who are avid gardeners. I knew a minister in a small town and he was greatly loved by his congregation. He was a gardener. And they were always afraid he was going to leave and go to another church. So every spring when they would see him in his garden planting, they would always breathe a sigh of relief because they figured he was going to stay for at least another season. So it's on my bucket list to be a gardener, but I'm not quite there yet. But the hard part about this is I know that there are dozens of people watching this service today who are gardeners and who are very good gardeners. They are the professionals of soil and sun. You know your pansies from your petunias and your cucumbers from your zucchinis. I still get daffodils and tulips mixed up sometimes. So I want to be clear that if you're tuning in, hoping to get some tips on making a great garden, I suggest you just flip your TV to HGTV and maybe find something there. And you know what's great about this being on YouTube? I can actually see if people are flipping to another channel instead of watching the service. So with that in mind, as an outsider, let me share what I do know about gardens, or at least I think I know about gardens. Number one, I know that they are either beautiful or functional or sometimes both. If you have a flower garden, you are planting for beauty. If you have a vegetable garden, you are planting for function. Both feed a different aspect of us. The body's need for food and our spirit's need for beauty. Secondly, I know that they are a huge amount of work. Gardens don't just happen. My neighbor, before he moved away, had two great loves in his life, smoking cigars and working in his garden. So whenever I could smell that sweet smell of cigar smoke, I always knew Harvey was out there working in his garden. And he would spend hours and hours and hours every week. And it paid off. He had one of the most beautiful gardens I have ever seen. I've concluded that there's no such thing as a lazy gardener. You get out of something what you put into it. As Rudyard Kipling said, gardens are not made by singing, oh, how beautiful, and then sitting in the shade. What else do I know about gardens? I know as beautiful as they are, they can attract all kinds of creatures and critters. Some that are good, some not so good. Some that you like, some you like not so much. A couple years ago, I officiated at a wedding in a backyard garden. 
and I was literally standing amongst all the flowers. Now, I know we all love our bees, and we talk about our bees, and we want to protect our bees, and I get that, and I love bees too, except I have a phobia of anything that flies and stings. So for the entire wedding, all I could focus on was five or six bees that were circulating around my legs. When the wedding was finally over, someone said, boy, Phil, you look pretty stressed up there, and it's not even that hot a day. But mostly what I know about gardens is that they are a testament to life in every way. A gardener is a co-creator in nurturing life on this planet. A gardener isn't just throwing seeds in the ground and then sitting back and watching them grow. He or she is removing weeds so that they're not choked, building fences to keep that which can harm them away, adding nutrients so they are properly fed. And in so doing, a gardener creates not only beauty to look at, but they create an entire little ecosystem, a little universe for butterflies and bees and grasshoppers and worms, all creatures where they can live and thrive. In a world where too often we are taking from the earth, gardening is doing exactly the opposite. It is investing in the earth. One could say that having a garden is a small act of rebellion against the tyrannical forces of depletion. Thus, gardening is an act of creation. And thus, it's an act of love, and it's very much an act of faith. A gardener works hand in hand with Mother Nature in the most sacred act of bearing life into the world and then protecting it and nurturing it to make sure that it endures and produces beauty and sustenance for others. It is a very selfless act. I love this quote. A society grows great when old people plant trees whose shade they will never sit in. Gardening is a commitment to life. It is an act of faith. It is an act of love. And thus gardens are places that in many ways can return that faith and return that sense of love. In a beautiful short story called The Perfect Garden, a writer named Alan Keough captures in his prose the sacred, almost therapeutic role of a garden. He writes this, Working in the garden soothed her thoughts, which were sometimes chaotic. It was peaceful and quiet, and it held so many memories. It had always been her refuge as a child, if something upset her, she would go outside and start gardening, kneeling for hours, digging and planting. It would calm her down and allow her to assess her thoughts slowly, one at a time. She could think things over, and there was no one there to rush her or judge her. If she needed to, she could tell the plants her problems, and they would listen. They wouldn't offer advice, as she sometimes wished they would, but they would listen their heads nodding in the breeze, and sometimes, it appeared, in sympathy. As far as she was concerned, the flowers absorbed aspects of each person who spent time in their presence, quietly listening, listening healing, and restoring hope. In this present time of frayed nerves and heightened anxiety and worry for the future, there is something so needed like a simple garden that can soothe us and bring to our weary souls some beauty and healing and hope. So to all the gardeners of the world, thank you, for you are the caretakers of life, especially in worrying times. You may not wear scrubs, but you are in your way frontline workers, reminding us that beauty still lives and grows among us. But let's go one more step with this. In this series, we're really talking about how places in our homes can teach us lessons about our inner life or our spiritual life. What lessons can we learn from a garden? Well, as I was planning this sermon, I was thinking of all kinds of lessons, life lessons that we could learn. For example, you reap what you sow would be a good lesson. Hard work has its own rewards would be a good lesson. We have to weed out the bad to protect the good 
would be a good lesson. But I kept being drawn to something deeper. I'm not sure it's a lesson about moral or ethical choices, but rather a simple, gentle reminder of divine presence. Let me go back to that passage that I read from the Bible in which Jesus speaks to his disciples and likens the love of God to the beauty of a flower. Jesus spoke these words during a time of worry. What was the worry? The worry was that storm clouds were gathering on the horizon. A great reckoning was coming, and he knew he would be at the center of it. After three years of spreading his gospel message of justice and peace, the authorities were determined to silence him. He knew what was coming. He could feel it, and his disciples could feel it too. There was an unspoken buzz of fearful energy. And so finally Jesus addresses it. Not by speaking about their worries, but speaking to their worries. And he said to them, why do you worry? Look around you. Look at the birds. Are they worrying? Are they worrying about what they're going to eat? No. But God feeds them every day. And look at the flowers. Are they worrying? Are they worrying what they're going to wear? No. And yet God clothes them in finery worthy of the time of Solomon. If God cares for the birds of the air and the flowers of the fields that much, think of how much more God must care for you. When you worry, said Jesus, look at the flowers and think about the love of God for you. If you were to go into your garden, if you have one, and look at the flowers, have you ever asked yourself, where did that beauty come from? Did it come from you? No. Nope. Did it come from a watering can? No. Nope. Did it come from the mulch that you bought at Garden Gallery? Nope. Those are simply the vessels that allow the beauty to appear. So where does the beauty come from? Of a tulip or a rose or a daffodil or a strawberry? It comes from some sacred, almost unimaginable source of creative life and love that at some point willed it into being, that it should bring beauty and peace to all who would look upon it. Why do you worry, said Jesus? Because the source of that beautiful life is the source of this beautiful life, is the source of your beautiful life. What do gardens represent? For me, they simply represent the presence and promise of God. They represent the divine and sacred life force and love that holds this world together. They represent the very creative will of life. And when you wander in a garden, you can almost feel that sense of life pulsing everywhere through flower and plant, through tomato stalk and around the golden heads of the marigolds. There's a sense of hope, a sense that God is near. And the love that bore that beauty into the world is the same love that holds each and every one of us. Think about this. Where did the risen Jesus first appear to Mary? It was in a garden. God's ultimate act of resurrection and new life took place among the flowers. Hence the verse many of us know so well. The kiss of the sun for pardon, the song of the birds for mirth, one is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. I think of the context of Jesus' words and I think of the context of our world, and I can't help but draw parallels. The storm clouds on the horizon, the fear and uncertainty, the, the worry and the heightened anxiety, as we struggle to come to terms with what that phrase, the new normal, is going to be all about. And we want to have the answers, and we want to figure it out. 
And when we can't, what do we do? We, we get stressed out. We, we draw ourselves into ourselves. Whenever I have to line up at a store, I don't know about you, maybe it's just me, but I'm sure I can feel that sense of apprehension in the air, just that dull ache of worry all around me. So I ask myself, what would Jesus do if he were there? No doubt he would take me by the hand, take me to a garden, tell me to look at the beauty I see, tell me to take a deep breath and remind me that the fear I feel is an illusion. What is real is the creative love, the sacred life force flowing through flower and flowing through me. And thus he would remind me that I can lean into that love. I can find strength in that love. I can find hope in that love, for it will never let me go. We are part of the fabric of something so much greater and so much deeper than the fears we wrap ourselves in. It's a river that runs through this world, a vein of goodness and love that not even this tiny virus can get into. And as we watch nature come to life around us and start to fill our gardens with so much beauty and goodness, can we not see it as a whisper of God reminding us that the divine presence is never far from us. It grows in our gardens, in our hanging baskets. It buzzes between flowers. It scurries along garden paths, collecting seeds and nuts. It swoops and dips and dives from nest to garden and back to nest again. The beautiful, creative, energetic force of life. God is alive because there's beauty in the flowers. And thus said Jesus, we need not worry. Elizabeth Browning caught this so well when she wrote, earth crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. There's a story about a church in Ireland. I'm going to end with this story. This church sat atop a hill and below the church is a valley with a deep blue lake, surrounded by a ribbon of deep green emerald hills. And in the foreground are fields filled with wildflowers. The church on the inside reflects pretty much any church of its time. Dark wooden pews, dark stained glass windows. On each window was a different scene depicting, depicting the life and ministry of Jesus, or on a couple of them there were pictures of saints. And interwoven in the windows are passages of scripture. Beautiful, but dark. On the far side of the church is the biggest window by far. At the top is written a Bible verse from Psalm 19 that says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth shows his handiwork. And the picture is of a heavenly realm with saints perched in the clouds. Well, the window, as the story goes, had spent centuries being buffeted by the winds and rains blowing from the valley below. It had become worn and faded and finally got to the point where it had become a hazard. It had loosened in its moorings and could crash down on the poor, unsuspecting churchgoers at any time. The small church congregation knew that it was time to replace the window. But with what? A small committee was struck that was given the task of deciding what biblical scene would be depicted on that new window. They invited people not just from the church, but from the surrounding community to submit ideas, and then they would decide. Drawings came from everywhere. Ideas flowed in. The committee knew they had their work cut out for them. They knew that they knew the pressure was on them to get it right, because this window was going to last for many more generations. They met for weeks in secret before finally coming to a decision. The church was closed for a time so those making the window could properly install it in secret, which they did. Tarps were put over it, covering it so nobody could see it. And finally came the day for the grand unveiling. The church, of course, was packed. There was standing room only. Hymns were sung, prayers were said. The minister gave a sermon of which nobody heard because everybody was focused on what was behind that tarp. 
The time came for the unveiling. People moved to the edge of their pews. The energy in the room was palpable. The priest stood on one side of the tarp. The chief elder stood on the other side of the tarp. And with a flourish from the organ, the tarp was removed. And there was a blank plane of glass. There was awkward shuffling. Was this a joke? And then people looked at the top of the window. And there was the original passage of scripture from the old window. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth shows his handiwork. And through the window, people could now peer into the valley below, to the blue lake, surrounded by the emerald hills, and there blowing majestically in the breeze, so close they could almost touch them, were the wildflowers. And there were smiles, as God, no longer trapped behind dark, stained glass, came flooding in, in a burst of light, on the wings of beauty, bearing the promise of peace. Why do you worry? Consider the flowers of the field. They don't worry, and yet God clothes them in beauty. If God cares so much for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, think of how much more God must care for you. Amen. And let us pray. We give thanks for our worship time. In this beautiful season that is upon us, there are so many signs of goodness, so many reminders of hope. We give thanks today for all those who help to bring beauty into this world. All those who, even in a small garden, a single flower pot, have made us stand for life. May what we find in field and flower give us perspective in turbulent times, calming restless spirits, giving pause to anxious thoughts. And may we continue to feel your unmistakable presence in our lives as we seek after the peace that only you can bring. May we rest in that peace as a butterfly rests on a leaf, or a chipmunk rests in the shade of a tree, and may it gently hold us in love. And now we take a quiet moment to offer the prayer concerns that we bring to worship today. God of birds and flowers, God of spring, God of new life and ever-present love, hear our prayers. And now we continue in prayer as we say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us this Sunday. And you can now, hopefully, if the weather's good, get out there in, in your, uh, your gardens and your backyards this afternoon. I would like to end with a, a Celtic blessing. It's simply called God's love. You are the peace of all things calm. You are the place to hide from harm. You are the light that shines in dark. You are the heart's eternal spark. You are the door that's opened wide. You are the guest who waits inside. You are the stranger at the door. You are the calling of the poor. You are my God and with me still. You are my love 
keep me from ill. You are my light, my truth, my way. You are my hope this very day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday.